Get over here! Hey, come on, baby. No, you know I love you. Oh, 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 oh! Ah, oh. oh, oh, oh. oh, hell no! Here goes my cold. I flip-flop a bit on fighting games. Some days I think we live in the best of times for the genre, but other days I'm nostalgic for the Dreamcast era, when Capcom ruled the ring with games like Clash of Heroes and Third Strike. Depends on the franchise, but I don't have to pick an era for Darkstalkers because Capcom refuses to make a new one of these! So, Darkstalkers 3 it is. The series that started this art style for Capcom fighters, Darkstalker's offbeat aesthetic and ludicrous characters fill a certain niche while still being a solid competitive fighter. Sure, the cast of Tekken has a luchador and a bear, but here we have Rikuo the Merman Heartthrob, Sienko the Double Trouble Jang Shi, and John Tal Bane the Werewolf with Nunchucks! Outlandish? Sure. Wacky? Definitely. But what's even wackier is that I actually got really attached to some of these characters. I don't know what it is, but in these short cutscenes and the blurbs in the instruction manuals, I was able to get invested in their individual plights. Maybe because each of them are so hopeless. There's a happy ending here and there, but most of these characters go through great loss and don't come out of the arcade mode any better than they came in. Somewhere on the verge between legitimate drama and dark humor, Darkstalkers hits an interesting tonal dissonance that I'm totally down with and it influenced the future of the genre in some great ways. How? Well, I'll get to that later, but for now, enjoy the solid mechanics and embrace the weird eccentric characters. It's a graveyard smash. <laughs> It cannot be understated what a surprising Smash Portal was. For what's essentially a piece of Half-Life bonus content, it stands on its own for innovative puzzle solving and inspired world building. If it has one flaw, it's that it leaves you wanting more, which is just about the best compliment you can give a game like this. That more was delivered in 2011 with the simply titled Portal 2. No clever subtitle, all that creative energy was saved for the game itself, expanding on the mind-bending puzzles with gels, tractor beams, and light bridges on top of the already perfect teleportation and momentum-based head-scratchers. For a puzzle game, it's the ideal balance. Any more complicated and it would have been off-putting, but it's just complex enough that you feel gratified for finding the solution on your own. The rooms never feel too obtuse or esoteric, because the rules of the game are taught and defined so well. And if you want some hilarious frustration, you can invite a friend along for some co-op, which is definitely worth the feeling of accomplishment if you have someone you know you can coordinate with. But it pales in comparison to the single-player story mode. Like with the gameplay, the story of Portal 2 uses the first game as a jumping-off point. GLaDOS reprises her role as the spiteful artificial antagonist, but now we get more exploration into her character, and the results are captivating, made better with the new arrivals of Wheatley and Cave Johnson. Altogether, this is some of the best writing I've ever seen in a video game. Seriously, ever! The dark humor, the timing, and the way it meshes with the gameplay, all of it is so wonderfully done. Most test subjects do experience some uh, cognitive deterioration after a few months in suspension. Now, you've been under for quite a lot longer, and it's not out of the question that you might have a very minor case of serious brain damage. There was a time I would have called this one of the greatest games ever made, and while plenty of others have come along, my love for this series is still, still alive. It's been fun. Don't come back. Sometimes, newer really is better. I've been with Mario Kart my whole life, and I have especially fond memories with the GameCube, DS, and Wii titles. But when a new game comes out with more content, unless it royally screws something up, it's going to basically eclipse the last entry. Which is how it goes with Mario Kart 8. Specifically, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Because why not have a few extra characters in a better battle mode? Oh, and they went with a two-item system? Yeah, definitely Deluxe. Though it'd be nice if I didn't have to pay full price for it. I already bought the Wii U version and all the DLC, so paying another $60 was a real blue shell to the nards. But anyway, Mario Kart 8 follows the same tried and true formula that's made Mario Kart the top racing game for 20 years. It's hectic, it's aggressive, there's a lot of skill involved, but enough chaos factors so that the better player doesn't automatically win every time. Mario Kart 8 did a lot to balance the unfair parts of the game, maybe a bit too much, 
But again, Deluxe rectified that later. The Super Horn is the counter item we've all been waiting for. That stupid lightning cloud is nowhere to be seen. No fake item boxes because nobody liked them anyway. And while I wish it wasn't on by default, I think the auto steering and auto acceleration is a great way to make sure that the game's accessible to everyone. You can say it's cheating, but you're not going to win anything higher than 50cc by relying on it. It's just there so that your baby cousin can finally play instead of screaming in the corner. Speaking of CCs, 200cc? Why the hell not? The tracks are not all designated for this much speed, but it's just so much crazy fun. And the tracks, both new and returning, are the real stars of Mario Kart 8. As the first HD outing for the series, Nintendo went nuts with the level of detail here, more than they had to. These backgrounds are fully rendered, even Mute City in Big Blue. I guess this is as close to a new F-Zero as you want to give us, Nintendo? Well, at least it's beautiful. In a world of crazy go-kart racers, there's certainly other contenders, but Mario is miles ahead of the pack. You want some cheese? Here's some cheese. Kid Icarus Uprising. Wasn't I talking about great writing a few entries ago? Universally, Portal 2 is going to appeal to more people, but I love this corny game, warts and all. We waited a long time to get a new Kid Icarus game, and glossing over the fact that the gameplay has changed, the graphics are different, and all of the characters have been completely reinvented, it's good to have it back. And now it's a Saturday morning cartoon. Not just in tone, though it nails that. The whole structure of the game is episodic, with mostly scripted dialogue sequences and big events. There's a story being told throughout with solid continuity, but sometimes the plot trails off into a self-contained arc. Medusa, the Chaos Kin, and Alien Invasion, seriously, where the hell did that come from? But it was never too much of a diversion for me. Every new chapter was another opportunity for these lovable characters to bounce off of each other. Wait, is this? <gasps> it is! A hot spring! Apparently someone likes his spa time. <sighs> now that's what I'm talking about. You go in fully dressed? Don't you at least want to change into a swimming tunic or something? Oh, no, no, no. The Angel's Code of Conduct says that we must always be ready for duty. I guess you wouldn't be an angel if you didn't do things by the book. Yeah. And I don't want to steam the sacred buns. We're done talking about this. Pit and Palutena have great banter. Veridi is an adorable tsundere. Dark Pit and Magnus want to be so serious, but the rest of the cast just won't let them be. And Hades, my literal god, Hades. I've been so looking forward to your arrival, Pitty Pat. Hades! 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 It's on! All this and more if you can wrap your mind and your hands around the control scheme, which admittedly is riddled with poor choices. The on-rail segments are great, but things get real messy whenever Pit touches down. It's that and the hokey humor that's keeping me from recommending this game to everyone I meet, but personally, I got used to it. And you will too if you play it for more than an hour. Most of the boss battles are a real treat, the hundreds of weapons lend themselves to plenty of customizations, and Sakurai's Toy Box approach to bonus content means you can replay the missions again and again, and still feel rewarded for doing so. With all these great ideas and all these issues that can be improved upon, it's a wonder we don't have a sequel yet. Come on Sakurai, get us a Switch follow-up! What's taking so long? Oh, right. Sorry Sakurai, I didn't mean it. I, I love you, please don't be sad. Portal wasn't the only good thing to come out of the orange box. There's also this crowbar game, I don't know, something about headcrabs? And of course, Team Fortress 2. Talk about a sequel outdating the original, what even was Team Fortress Classic? I couldn't care less about those gritty online shooters like Call of Duty or Halo, but when I first discovered Team Fortress 2 through the Meet the Sniper video, I had to know what this was all about. Man, those videos were such good marketing! TF2's gameplay is based around its classes, which in other games would be variations on the same poorly shaven army dude. But here, not only does each class play completely differently, each class is his own character with personality and charm. While you try to achieve different objectives for your team, such as capturing a control point or stealing enemy intelligence, not only are these classes interacting with each other mechanically, they're interacting as characters, 
ridiculous, stereotypical characters, but still characters. There's an intricate balance, and in a way, disbalance to the classes, only deepened with all of the unlockable weapons and gear. The Heavy can mow down opponents, but a speedy scout or a rocket jumping soldier can outmaneuver him, which won't matter if he has a medic that ubercharges him, but what if that medic is taken out by a spy? But what if that spy is sniffed out by a pyro? But nothing's getting past that engineer's turret, except this demo man who's bouncing grenades around the corner, but never mind, because now everyone's respawning as Sniper. And even those strategies don't work every time. If you're good enough, you can overcome the inherent advantages one class might have over another. In other team-based online games, it can get real frustrating if your team's not working with you. Please somebody play Medic, we don't need any more NGs! But unlike those other online games, I don't get upset when it happens in Team Fortress 2. Everything is so silly, and there's not any kind of reward for playing well other than bragging rights. It's fine to just let a match devolve into shenanigans sometimes. Heck, the achievements encourage it! And that's what TF2 is, a semi-competitive series of shenanigans. Sure, it's got a weird fascination with hats, and sure, it pioneered new forms of microtransactions, but it's still going strong 10 years later, so it's gotta be doing something right. Feelings! Look, mate. You know, it has a lot of feelings. Blokes were bludging their wife to death with a golf trophy. Professionals have standards. Be polite. Be efficient. Have a plan to kill everyone you meet. Must have been unconscious for a while. Sorry, last time I'll do that bit, I just really love that intro. I've talked about this game to death with how much it knocked my socks off. It's an amazing mystery game, up there with Capcom's other great whodunits. Ghost Trick is full of twists and turns until it hits a climax that, well, I certainly didn't see it coming. But for what, my fourth time talking about this, let's focus on how it excels as a puzzle game. Every room you enter is a new conundrum, with you trying to prevent a murder while being basically intangible. Moving your character in this game is unlike any other game I've played. You have to manipulate the environment poltergeist style and hop across different objects to inhabit. All the while, you're trying to influence people who don't even know you're there. Knocking things over, making noises, anything to get them to just look in the right direction. There's a cause and effect to all of your actions, and by turning back time, you slowly master your limited ability to affect the world around you. Every room is a Rube Goldberg machine just waiting to spring. In a few cases, literally. And it's amazing how integrated it all feels. The story's a little farcical, but the puzzle elements sitting around never felt contrived to me. I actually believe that the objects in the room just happen to be this way. Let's compare to a runner-up for this countdown, 999. It also has a great mystery story and engaging puzzles, though it's clear that the puzzles are put there for you to solve. To be fair, that's how 999's story works, and it works well. It's a Saw kind of situation, and solving the puzzles rewards you with more engaging story with great characters. But in Ghost Trick, the puzzles are the characters, and the story is the puzzle. You're not just working out a riddle, you're moving through an event. You're mechanically interacting with pieces of the mystery, and it feels to me like I'm saving people, not just moving my character to where they can save people. I don't know, it's a weird comparison, but like I said, I've covered this game a lot, and I'm running out of ways to praise it. I assure you though, Ghost Trick deserves the attention. I might be an easy guy to impress, because lately, every game I play, I pretty much love. In fact, after I started writing the script, I had to stop to add four different games to the list. The first of those games? Octopath Traveler. Square Enix owns three of the biggest names in RPGs, but we shouldn't overlook when they make a weird standalone title from time to time. The World Ends With You, Parasite Eve, Bravely... Default? Uh, well, the results are always interesting at least, and Octopath Traveler is no exception. It feels almost like a writing experiment the dev team conducted that just happened to become a competent RPG. Eight characters, eight stories. And I mean, eight separate stories. They don't connect in any way, at least not until the end in a difficult to unlock final scenario. The heroes travel together and have occasional banter, but for the most part things are segregated. So it's a good thing that all eight of the stories are really good. Some more than others, remember I made a countdown about it. And there isn't a single character I'd say I dislike, both in personality and in battle. Ulbrich is an old, jaded bodyguard and hits like a truck. Cyrus is the brilliant but socially inept professor with killer elemental coverage. Primrose has a dark past and sick dance moves. The list goes on. 
All the tales are small in scope for the majority of the journey, but the personal stakes involved are palpable, and at times it achieves some nice moral ambiguity. Feels a lot like a set of Dungeons and Dragons sessions actually, and I think that's the main reason I like it, because I love D&D. There's some level grinding involved if you want to see the whole game, but it utilizes a rather robust battle system, incorporating aspects of Bravely Default and even a weakness system similar to Persona 5. And I'm all about the HD pixel aesthetic. It looks weird at points, and the bloom is out of control, but it feels like I'm looking at a 16-bit pop-up book, and I love that. Maybe in a year or so, I'll have calmed down and the game will slink down below my top 50, but for now, Octopath Traveler has me staggered. You should have studied harder. Before Coco, before the Book of Life, before El Tigre, there was Grim Fandango. This feels like one of the weirder choices on this list, doesn't it? Among all these recent franchise titles and nostalgia pandering indie games, this 1998 cult point and click adventure is pretty unassuming. But even without the flash of other games, there's something about Grim Fandango I keep coming back to. Probably that it combines two of my favorite motifs, crime noir and Hispanic mythology. Manny Calavera, in particular, is one of my favorite characters of all time. He's just so suave, so charming. He's often lying through his teeth, but you still love him. He's flawed, but as he learns to care about Meche and the fate of the Land of the Dead, it just gets to me. The gameplay is slow-paced, and like anything in this genre, sometimes the solutions to your problems are a little abstract. What elevates it above Sam and Max or Monkey Island for me is how many of the puzzles revolve around the characters and their circumstances, not just combining every two objects together until something works. This is especially true in the second chapter, where you explore a casino and manipulate people into getting you a seat on a ship, get a sailor fired, cure your friend's gambling addiction, flirt your way through a metal detector check. Even if you get stuck, which you will, it's still just interesting to meet people and see what they have to say. The art style refuses to age. It's awkward and stiff, and that's what I love about it. They're not just supposed to be skeletons, they're supposed to look like paper mache Dia de los Muertos decorations. And the lack of expressions adds to Manny's bone-dry line delivery. Ever cheated on your husband? Mr. Calavera, there's no ring on my finger. There's no skin on it either. I guess you'll just have to trust me then. If you've seen my top 10 skeletons countdown, you already know that the plot of this game means a lot to me. Probably more than it should, but that's just how I am. I overanalyze things, and this game is obviously working with some social satire. If you have the patience or are okay with using a guide, give it a go. Just, por favor, get the remastered version and avoid the tank controls. I wouldn't wish those on anyone. Bye, Carla. Drop dead! My favorite Tales game? Oh, you guys are killing me! Well, first, let's talk about why it makes the list. Tales of Blank is the pinnacle when it comes to making a JRPG look like an anime. The games tell great stories rooted in fantasy tropes, while also deconstructing them to make interesting plots about complex, world-affecting decisions, starring lovable characters with great visual designs and memorable three-dimensional personalities. Endless conversation options let you dig as deep as you could possibly want into the inner thoughts of these heroes. The gameplay is right up my alley, an RPG that plays like a fighting game, complete with combos to learn and powerful mystic arts to unleash. Whichever game you pick, chances are it's a good one. As for my favorite, well, I had Zillia on this list for a while, but then I changed my mind in March, which might have annoyed my co-writer a little bit, but in my defense, Zillia was only just a hair above Vesperia for me, and that was before the Definitive Edition, which is so good. Like Zillia, every character in Vesperia is an absolute gift. Bookworm Rita, Princess Out of Water Estelle, Team Dad Raven, Yuri's the guy you wish you could be, Carol's the guy you actually are, Judith is all the Lord of the Rings elf tropes done right, and Rapid is a dog smoking a pipe. He's way too cool to be here. All of them are fully realized and explored, and all of them are really fun to play. I could say the same about Zillia, that's another perfect cast right there. But especially with a definitive edition, we just have more perfection in Vesperia, adding in good guy Flint and Patty who, having only experienced her story recently, actually made me cry. The combat is really top notch in both games, but lately I've been leaning towards Vesperia's system. It's more strict with the art strings, but that just makes it more rewarding for me to pull off a 200 hit wombo combo. And getting skills through equipment makes me care a lot more about making money and upgrading existing weapons. 
Part of what had me picking Zillia for so long was my playthrough with Comic on his channel. We got really into the game's theming, and Zillia definitely had the strongest villain, but Vesperia has so many great players like Nan, Gaussian Draught, Jaeger, Zagi. I was never left wanting for a good adversary. When it comes down to it, my favorite Tales game tends to be whichever game I played most recently. And that's a sign of a great series right there. Playing any of them makes me happy. We may be a small guild now, but we'll make it big. We are brave Vesperia. Smooth sailing. I'm not too grounded in nostalgia, am I? I mean, most of the games I've listed so far from the last 10 years. But this is my list, and games I grew up on hold some power here. I was usually a Nintendo kid, but I'd occasionally venture out into the strange land of Sony and spend some time with a certain Bandicoot. I could just put the whole insane trilogy on here, which is a great remaster, but that doesn't do justice to the hours I spent toiling away with Crash Bandicoot Warped. Are we all agreed that this was the best out of the three? I also think it's the only game that the Insane Trilogy doesn't do 100% better, if only because the original had better control in some vehicle sections. And the introduction of Uka Uka, he looks so much more menacing on the PS1. But I digress. Crash 1 creates a good platforming system, Crash 2 perfects it, and Warp takes that perfected system and spreads it across time and space. Prehistoric jungles, Egyptian tombs, the Great Wall of China, 1950s motorways. I'd say the sky's the limit, but you play up there too and continue right on into space. Every level has something unique about it, but it all feels like it belongs together somehow. The best parts are when you're simply platforming. If I can make a comparison here, let's talk about Mario, the platforming king. Mario had an excellent jump into 3D, partly by eschewing the linear levels of the 2D games in favor of open 3D playgrounds. Really lets you appreciate how well Lakitu's camera worked. Now if I can be so bold, I don't think Naughty Dog was all that good at creating 3D space. In fact, if you look at the best games of the PS1, most of them are either menu-based RPGs or restrict you to 2D movement. Crash has 3D movement, but they weren't confident enough to make an all-access camera yet, so instead, they locked it in place and made the levels linear again. 3D, but linear. So, in a weird way, Crash is more like a 3D Mario game than Mario was at the time. At least the way Mario games were pre-64. Just a weird thought I had. But none of this is bad, this approach locks you into the challenge and forces you to master the Bandicoot. There's no distractions, no way around it. It's just you and that tricky jump you can't quite make. Get good, Crash. With crazy locales, offbeat humor, and a memorable final bout with Cortex while avoiding the Masked Brothers beam struggle, Crash 3 is a wild ride. The Insane Trilogy version is probably the way to go if you've never played it before but I'll always look fondly on the days of my childhood, cutting my teeth on those low-poly platforms.